Hey everyone, I'm Alex, and today on Big Out Books, I'm here to do part one of my June wrap-up. If you didn't see my June TBR video, essentially in Canada, June is National Indigenous Peoples Month, so it's a month where I try to make a greater effort to read content by First Nations, Métis, and Inuit authors. I also noticed on BookTube that people were participating in a Reading Women readathon, so I thought why not combine the two ideas, and this month I've been entirely focused on reading books by Indigenous women, and it's been an incredible experience so far. I made a TBR list of about 15 books, and I've gotten through seven at this point. I wanted to make this video in order of favorite to least favorite because I know that I'm very lucky that I can dedicate a whole month of my reading year to just trying books by Indigenous female authors, but I know that that's not possible for everyone, so I really wanted to start off this video with the essential reads, books that I think that the most amount of people would enjoy, and kind of work my way down from there. Starting off with the best book that I've read so far this month, it hands down goes to I Am Woman, a Native Perspective on Sociology and Feminism by Lee Miracle. If you've been following my channel for a while, you know I absolutely adore Lee Miracle. I think she has a brilliant mind, and reading this text has only further cemented that opinion for me. As you can guess from the title, this is a work of non-fiction. It's very slim, 140 pages, but it packs a huge punch. Like, I got probably about 13 pages of like full-size notes from this book. So really, there is a lot going on, so many ideas. And basically, this is just exploring the painful realities of living in a colonized country as a marginalized and oppressed woman. So it's not an easy subject, right? This is difficult and it's very painful, but Lee Miracle is so real and raw and honest with her writing that makes it such a powerful read. In the first chapter, she writes about the experience of colonization. Like miners in a shaft, we are weighed down by the oppressive dirt which colonization has heaped upon us. Unlike miners, the dirt is heaped upon us deliberately, and no one is terribly interested in removing the load, including ourselves. So Lee Miracle uses these powerful images, these metaphors. She clearly has a poetic mind that could really help you understand the difficult concepts that she's trying to talk about. And I really enjoyed in this text, sometimes she would just break up her paragraphs and insert a poem responding to the topic. So this is a work of nonfiction, but it's very creative and it's very personal. There's one particularly strong chapter in this book where she recreates a conversation that she had with a friend late one night across a kitchen table. And you really are conjured to that sense of place, these two women having this intimate conversation, revealing painful truths about their life. So she is kind of going back in her memory, relaying what happened in this conversation, and also responding to it now that she's an older woman who has more experience. So it's just a really, creative way of putting together a nonfiction piece. What I've also loved about reading this book is that she hits on so many topics and these are all topics that have been explored in all of the other books that I've been reading this month. This book provided me with more insight about what it's like to be an Indigenous woman, but also this book really challenged me on a personal level as a settler living in Canada, benefiting from this systemic oppression. Particularly in this book, she really hates the Canadian education system and teachers in particular. Um, I think there's one quote, educators are the primary thrust of racism, the front line of soldiers in the battle to eradicate all that is not Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. Reading lines like that was a painful experience for me because I am an educator that is complicit in this system designed to perpetuate this system of oppression that's going on right now in Canada. So even though I'm a person that has very good intentions, it caused me to think a lot about what are some of the damages that I might be perpetuating. So this was a challenging text for me, but I think it's important to go through that experience of calling out yourself and making you think critically about the society that you live in, because I feel like as settlers in Canada, we don't necessarily do that enough. 
So this book just sparked that conversation in my mind. And since it's so slim and powerful, I would really recommend anyone who's interested in the topic to pick this one up. I feel like I could actually talk about that book all day, so I'm going to cut myself off. Moving on to the best novel that I read so far this month, that would have to go to The Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich. She's an Ojibwe author that I've been meaning to read for a very long time, and I'm so glad that I did because I loved this book. There was something very cinematic about this book. Like, I could just picture like a really classic movie happening in my head while I was reading it. It's one of those coming-of-age tales, kind of reminded me of Stand By Me with this group of boys that are growing up and learning some hard truths about the society that they're living in. This book revolves around a crime that happens on a reservation where a woman is brutally attacked and it's told through the perspective of her adolescent son. So part of the book is trying to figure out who committed this crime but the more interesting section of the book is trying to figure out what's going to happen next and how are they going to find justice. So it is a bit of a revenge tale. Joe's father is a judge, so he obviously has a lot of faith in the legal system, even though you realize in this book the legal system is really stacked against Indigenous people. And since this crime, they can't prove whether it happened on the reservation or not, it seems like there's not going to be a lot of power in the court to prosecute the way that they want to. So this leads Joe to start having thoughts of revenge and how he can take justice out on this person in his own hands. So there's a lot of interesting questions there. What do you do when your legal system is not there to protect you? So I thought this was just a fascinating read. There is that intensity that comes from the crime at the center of the story, but also it some ways it's a very slow paced coming of age tale, a very character driven story, and I could not wait for the hour that I would spend reading this book every night. Like I was looking forward to it all day. So this was just a just beautifully written book with some really interesting ideas and an engaging story. The best collection of short stories that I read this month has been Bad Endings by Carly Baker. She identifies as a Cree, Métis, Icelandic author, and these were just a really quirky batch of short stories, and they're kind of the ones that feel like they're very brief and fleeting, where Baker just kind of like introduces you to a character, gives you a little bit of time in their life, and then will gradually remove you. So they're brief and they're strange. There are a lot of contemporary aspects to these stories, so slang, pop culture references, and references to social media in a lot of these stories. One of them is about a couple who goes on this intense trek through the rugged landscape of the Yukon. And still, even as they're living in nature, they're still thinking about taking photos so that they can post them online because if people don't see that you're going on a trip like this, does it even matter? <laughs> so there were stories like that. Another few stories that I really liked, there was one set on a bee farm, the kind of hardships of working there. And there was one about people who were the operators for a suicide phone hotline. And it was about them partying before it hit midnight on Valentine's Day when the calls would start flooding in. So if you're interested in brief but well-crafted short stories about intriguing people, Bad Endings is a pretty cool collection to check out. Another novel that I read this month was Slash by Jeanette Armstrong. This is regarded as a very pivotal work of First Nations fiction and it explores the life of this guy named Tommy, also known as Slash, He's from the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia, but he ends up traveling all around through Canada and the United States because he gets involved in the struggle, or the decolonization movement, that was particularly active in the 60s and the 70s. Tommy is a character who is really on a journey of self-discovery and learning. He doesn't really know how he wants to achieve change, but he just wants to be part of the process to make life better for Indigenous people. So it was interesting reading about these real historical events from a fictional perspective. Um, a lot of these events I had first read about in this book, Unsettling Canada, A National Wake-Up Call, um, by Arthur Manuel. So 
there were events like occupying the Indian Affairs Office and also marching to Ottawa as part of the Constitution Express to make sure that Aboriginal title and rights were recognized in the new draft of the Constitution. So these are all really important events that have happened and it was neat to see Jeanette Armstrong incorporate them into her fictional story. What I like about this book is that it portrays the complexity of this struggle because there are so many people and so many different perspectives. And this novel has characters that all have very different views that sometimes creates conflict with each other. So whenever there's an issue presented, Jeanette Armstrong will provide characters that will give you different points of view, which I thought created a really fascinating dialogue as Tommy tries to work around these people to form his own opinion. So there are people who think that they should be bargaining with the Canadian government as part of their treaty rights and they need to make money immediately to provide for their families. And there are other people who think that you can't bargain at treaty tables and you need to hold out so that your Aboriginal sovereignty is recognized. So there are always more multiple sides to these issues. The downside to this kind of style was that every character really seemed to exist as a, as a vehicle for their viewpoint, and the dialogue never came across as very authentic, since each character was kind of pushing forth this kind of political ideology. They did kind of sound like they were textbooks almost that were just explaining their theories. So in that way, I didn't connect to the text on an emotional level. That being said, there's something compelling about the calm and prosaic style of writing in this book. When I was going into this book, knowing that it was going to be about the struggle, I thought this was going to be like really hot and passionate. So there was some kind of power in it, almost that it wasn't like an angry polemical text, but rather it just presented the situation all of its complexity. So I could definitely recommend this text if you're looking to learn more about this period of history and different activist movements that have been happening on both sides of the border. Next, I'm going to talk about the poetry collection called Infinite Citizens of the Shaking Tent by Liz Howard. And I can confidently say to you that these poems are brilliant, but too brilliant for me. You know, they kind of went over my head. I don't have the best track record of reading poetry. <laughs> and I've just been teaching poetry, and I've really been trying to tell them, don't try to force a meaning out of a poem. If you read a poem and you're not sure what happened at the end, that's okay. We shouldn't expect poems to be about something and not to get frustrated in that experience of being confused. So I really had to try to follow my own advice while reading these poems because they did not make a lick of sense to me at first, but I just tried to slow down, read them multiple times, read them out loud, and enjoy how Liz Howard plays with language. So these are just very intelligent. She uses a lot of scientific terms and applies them to the natural world. So if you're interested in those topics, this is a really cool collection of poetry, just a little too abstract for me. Although my favorite image in this poem was about a cluster of maggots crawling out of a dead bird that she compares to as like a string of pearls and I thought there was something really funny in that comparison. So yeah, these were like a little too much for me, but still glad I read them. Not sure how much I understood. If this is your kind of deal, definitely check out Liz Howard. The last two books that I have to talk about are by Dawn Dumont. So I have one of her novels called Rose's Run and her collection of short stories called Glass Beads. And unfortunately, these are appearing kind of at the bottom of the list because they really weren't my favorite reads of the month. Both of these books were very accessible and lighthearted reads. So if you're looking for something that's just kind of funny and easy to flip through the pages, then Don Dumont would fit the bill. Just, it's my personal preference as a reader. I like to be left with a little bit more substance at the end of a book, and I didn't really feel that I had that kind of connection with Don Dumont. Rose's Run is a book that has two kind of contrasting plots. There's the story of Rose who gets out of this really terrible long-term relationship and she is working on turning her life around. So she starts taking up long distance running and she gets a new job. So it's kind of about her life as a single mom and her relationship with her kids. And then there's also this kind of like darker, more horror element where this evil supernatural witch has been conjured and wants to destroy all the men in the town. So 
kind of two very different stories happening. Unfortunately, the evil witch story, as awesome as it sounds, was really not executed all that well and never really felt intense. I can't say that I enjoyed the supernatural elements in this book, but I did enjoy the parts that were more like a social comedy about life on the res and what it's like to be a single mom. So Rose the Run was okay. I can't say, however, that I enjoyed her short story collection, Glass Beads. The short stories are interconnected, they revolve around a group of four friends, and you check in on them at various moments in their life over the span of about 10 years. So in the earlier half of they were all kind of young and trying to figure out their lives and what they want to do, and then in the later stories they're kind of more established, and they have career paths and complicated relationships with each other. My main problem with these stories is that they just weren't enjoyable to read. And maybe that was because I didn't connect to these characters. Like, I just felt like I didn't really know who these people were. So I didn't really care about checking in on them or seeing how their lives would turn out. Another problem I had with this collection is that none of these stories would be strong enough to stand on its own. So they do kind of rely on this concept and they don't really have enough kind of artistic vision to exist as an independent short story. So sorry to end this video on a bummer, but yeah, I did not really enjoy Glass Beads. So those are the books that I've read so far in June. I have really enjoyed this reading project so far, and I love discovering some new authors. I'm about halfway through a bunch of really awesome books, so I can't wait to talk to you again in part two, where we'll find out if I can finish the other eight books on my TBR. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again in part two.